Hi, uh, my name is Timothy Gager, and welcome to Virtual Thursday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight, my guest is Mr. Tom, award-winning author, Mr. Thomas uh, McNeely. And uh, I will uh, show you his bio in a second. I got a little distracted. I didn't get, didn't bring the bio up. How, how, how did I, how did I manage that? But I did, I already prepared a, there was a great bio online for, for Thomas. And uh, let's see if I can, uh, see if I can grab it. There it is. Thank you for having yeah. me. All right. So we were ready to, we're ready to uh, check this. This is the most exciting, exciting part of the evening when I, share the screen for the bio. An East Side Houston native, Thomas H. McNeely has published short stories and nonfiction for The Atlantic, Texas Monthly, Plowshares, and many other magazines and anthologies, including Best American Mystery Stories and Algonquin Books, Best of the South. His stories have been shortlisted for the Pushcart Prize, Best American Short Stories, and the O. Henry Award anthologies. He's received National Endowment for the Arts, Wallace Stegner and McDowell Colony Fellowships for his fiction. His first book, Ghost Horse, won the Gival Press Novel Award and was shortlisted for the William Sarion International Prize in Writing. He currently teaches in the Stanford Online Writing Studio and at Emerson College here in good old Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, without anything else from me, I'm going to turn it over to Thomas and uh, Thomas's section of the, his reading. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming to the reading. I'm gonna be reading from um, my book, a uh, book of short stories called Pictures of the Shark. Uh, this, the stories in this book were written over a period of 20 years. Uh, I wrote a novel in the middle of, in the midst of reading, writing them. Um, So it, there's there are a great variety of sh stories, uh, types of stories, but they all center around uh, this rather unfortunate uh, character, uh, Buddy Turner. And uh, they go from his childhood, early in his childhood, uh, to his young adulthood. And uh, he comes from a, a family which is quite broken. Um, but <laughs> it's hard for me to concentrate with this cat. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I'll read a little bit from uh, the title story, Pictures of the Shark, which, uh, is I think pretty self-explanatory and maybe if I have a little bit of time left I'll, I'll read from um, another story. Um, sorry I'm a little disorganized here. Um, just setting up my timer. Uh, okay the uh, this is from a story called Pictures of the Shark. On the freeway, the tires of his father's car made heartbeats like the music in Jaws that signaled the great shark's approach. Everywhere Buddy went, the shark followed, grinning, deadly, a silent friend. Buddy sat in the back seat, wedged next to suitcases his father had lugged out of the woman's apartment. The woman sat in front in Buddy's place. All the way from Houston through Dallas, her thin, breathless voice had fluttered over road signs and billboards, license plates and historical markers, circling what a good time they were going to have together on their trip to Universal Studios in Hollywood. It's so nice that we can all finally be together, she said. I think we're going to be special friends, Buddy, don't you? The woman paused, waiting for an answer. Buddy pressed his forehead against his window. Outside, a freight train seemed to move slowly backward. At night, 
Trains moaned past the house where Buddy and his mother lived, where his father used to live. Buddy wondered if any of the cars he saw would pass his mother's house. He closed one eye and framed the picture he would take, like leaving a note in a bottle. His mother's camera was a thin black plastic rectangle whose lens was grimed with sand from trips to the beach with his father long ago. But he hadn't told his father that he had his mother's camera. The night before, he'd slipped it into his suitcase so he could get pictures of Bruce, the mechanical shark from Jaws at Universal. His mother had caught him and said it would have been okay for him to bring it if he'd asked. Now, she'd said, he'd have to take some pictures for her. Skip ahead a little bit in the story, and they've stopped. Uh, they've stopped at the for a night at the hotel. The motel room was small and dimly lit. Two beds with red woolen blankets faced a bureau on top of which sat a battered TV. While they unloaded the car, Mary Winifred kept touching Buddy, light taps on his back tiny hands on his shoulder. His father glanced at them, frowning. After they finished with the car, he announced it was time for Buddy to call his mother. Give us a minute, he said to Mary Winifred. Mary Winifred retreated to the bathroom, her mouth a tight line. His father rolled his eyes, as he did sometimes when Buddy's mother got upset. When they left Houston, he had promised his mother that Buddy would call every night. His father sat on a bed and waved Buddy over to the one across from him. He picked up the receiver and cupped his hand over its mouthpiece. Your mother's a wonderful woman, he said. Buddy nodded. Yes, sir. We don't want to do anything to hurt her, do we? No, sir. You're a smart kid, his father said. You understand a lot more than I did when I was your age. You know a lot about movies. Blushing, Buddy stared down at his hands, which were clenched and dirty. Look at me, his father said, lowering his voice. I'm real proud of you. I wanted to take you on this trip so we can get to know each other better and so you can get to know Mary Winifred. But you understand it would hurt your mother real badly if she knew Mary was with us, don't you? I don't need to explain that to you, do I? No, sir. His father smiled as if he were in pain. Good, he said. Yes, sir, Buddy said. You don't have to call me that here, his father said. Call me dad. Buddy looked at the dingy swimming pool colored walls and the dead green eye of the TV and then at his father. Okay, dad, he said. After his father spoke to an operator, he handed Buddy the phone. Buddy saw his mother in their bright yellow kitchen, a box of orange snack crackers and a glass of wine on the table next to her. Though he was 10 years old, he still sometimes sat on her lap, burying in his, fa his face in her white uniform, breathing the smell of the laboratory where she worked. Honey, she said, is that you? Yes, Mama, he said. Are you okay? You don't sound like yourself. Buddy felt dizzy and sick, as if he were on top of a tall building, itching to jump. Yes, Mama, he said, I'm fine. His father took the phone and said Buddy needed to go to the bathroom. Yes, he said, Buddy was fine. He looked at Buddy and Buddy looked away. What do you mean, his father asked. Of course he sounds fine. Buddy took off his shoes and got under the covers. It seemed wrong to take off his clothes. He shut his eyes his father's voice so weary and adult that Buddy could almost believe what it said it was true, told his mother a version of their day in which only he and Buddy appeared. Tomorrow, he said, they'd try to make it to his parents' cabin in Colorado. Yes, he said, he would be careful. Now they needed to get some sleep. Then there was silence in which Buddy knew his mother told his father that she loved him. His father gently replaced the phone in its cradle. Springs creaked as his father rose from the bed and gunshots and the trample of hooves filtered from the TV. 
Buddy kept his eyes closed. The bathroom door creaked open. Does she want you to call her every night? Mary Winifred asked. His father said he didn't know. I don't call that helping, he said to Buddy. If you were in the army, they'd march your ass in the heat till you dropped. Buddy lay perfectly still. What's wrong, darling, Mary Winifred said. His father's weight settled next to Buddy, and his rough, clean-smelling fingers tapped Buddy's nose. What are you doing playing possum, he said, his voice quivering with anger. Don't you know you can't lie to me? Jimmy, Mary Winifred said, what do you mean? Let him sleep. And that's seven minutes. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, that's kind of what I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about stories that are longer than seven minutes. But first, I want to open with a question that from Robert that he put in the chat. Now, first of all, you don't have to read the chat. I'll, I'll pick them off as they Thank come. You. But Thomas, Robert asked, Thomas, you mentioned Buddy appears in all the short stories in the book. Why did you choose the format of a series of short stories versus a novel about him? Well, I did write a novel about this character as well. Um, some of the stories were sketches for the, the novel. Uh, some of them were written from other characters' points of view. The whole, the novel was in the child's point of view. There, there's stories in the, in the collection that from, uh, a much older age, his, 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 that, that character at a much older age, and also from other characters' perspectives. So they didn't, they, they, there were some things that d didn't fit in the, in the novel. But it, so it, who is, so who ahead. is Buddy Turner? Oh, he's my alter e ego, you know, every, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, Yes, I mean that's that's who he is. So uh, the the book, uh, the novel, and the, and this book were very much about you know writing about about autobiographical experiences. Although I have to say um, the experiences and the, the the reaction that I got to the book, both the novel and this book, when people said, "Well, that is that sounds like exactly what happened. It seems very real," but almost nothing in the book is exactly what happened in my life. So something had to, of course, those of you who write fiction know that something has to happen to the material when you turn it into fiction. So um, I'll just say one thing more. I found it, the interesting thing to me is that this book is much more coherent to me in a way than the, the novel was. Well, the novel you had a gap. Right. You started the novel in 2003 when you were, uh, you know, working with Tobias Wolf, And then, um, unfortunately, your father committed suicide, which kind of put things on hold. And, but it spun its way into the book. Yes. Um, yeah, that was, that was some very bad timing. <laughs> um, uh I, I was very fortunate at that time to be it it uh, in the Stegner workshop with uh, with Toby and also with um, John Larue, who was a wonderful teacher and writer. He died, I think, two years ago. Um, and my father's taking his own life in the middle of all that was very. Um, it was traumatic, obviously, and it was also um, became quite difficult to write <laughs> about <laughs> uh, about those experiences. So um, it did. I, I mean, I finished. Obviously, I finished the novel. It took a, a long, longer time to finish the novel, but um, that was a curveball. No, no. How long do you think it would have taken to have written that novel if you didn't have that tragedy? I mean, that's a very difficult. <laughs> that's a difficult question to answer, but it, uh, it, 
it changed. I, I mean, it, it, what happened after that is it took, it was 10, 10, nine, 10 years after that. I, I will like to think I would have finished it quicker than, than that. Um, well, hold up the cover again for pictures of the shark because I was really taken by the lovely cover and the photograph on it. Now, who took that picture? This is a, a retouched, it's a painted over picture and the uh, managing editor at Texas Review Press, which is a, an imprint of Texas A&M Press, uh, the managing editor, um, did a really wonderful job with this uh, with this whole book, and including suggesting the order of the stories. Um, P.J. Carlyle, Peter Carlyle, the managing editor. So he himself, it's hard to see. I don't know whether you can see, but this isn't a photograph, or it's a photograph <laughs> that has been cut and shifted the pieces of it shifted and also painted over the the water slide here is kind of an impossible water slide you, you, it doesn't fit together really um and i don't know where he got this imagery but he, this is this is his uh work and he, he really did a, a a great job with the book so how did you decide what to include in this book? Now, this book is about 160 pages of eight short stories, and you don't really see short stories of that length too much these days. So how did you decide what to include? And were there some Buddy Turner stories that, you know, Buddy got, you know, sent to his room and did not appear? <laughs> um yeah, I guess I'm a sort of a dinosaur. I, I write these long stories. Um there were, I published several other stories that were not to do with Buddy Turner um, at all that didn't make it into the book. There was one that was sort of tangentially, and he, he was mentioned as a character, but it was, it was about another character, his mother. It's interesting that the reaction that I've gotten to this book, the people seemed to like his mother much better than him. They wanted, <laughs> wanted uh, more stories from, from her point of view. Um, so, but yeah, there, there were, um, I don't know, three, four stories that didn't, didn't make it in because they were not on the same topic. Same now, what contemporary writers do you read now that are, writing 15 page short stories. Gosh. Um, and if there are no contemporary ones, where do you, you know, who's in, who's in your bookshelf? In my bookshelf, uh, you know, is uh, Joyce. I mean, I keep, I go back to Dubliners every couple of years, Alice Monroe, William Trevor, uh, Joy Williams, even, I mean, I, I love her work. It has nothing, you know, I, I, it's very different from mine. Um, uh, uh, Gerald Murnane is a, a Australian author whose work I admire very much, but again, it has, it's very different. He's sort of like a latter day Beckett. Um, I, so I, I don't know, you know, where I, I, the, the, I think my idea of what a story was is formed from reading when I was much younger, uh, Truman Capote and uh, John Cheever and um, uh, uh, I, Alice Monroe came later, but it's Joyce also from when I was much younger. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to answer your question. Oh, I think you answered. You did a great job. Uh, so I've also checked on some of your nonfiction. You've got a, a piece called My Summer 
of the shark. Now, why sharks? I don't know. I mean, uh, I I was just sort of fat. I I mean, well, part of it, the story that I just read to you from is about this boy's fascination with a, a a shark as sort of a totem. And one of the things I was trying to understand in in writing the story was was why I was so fascinated with the shark as a kid. And I I, I think, you know as far as I can tell, it was a symbol of a, or a, a kind of a, a familiar that was powerful and uh, deadly <laughs> and uh, it had power that I couldn't have as a, as a child. Um, and I, I mean, my daughter is also fascinated with sharks. I don't know what it is about sharks and, and kids, you know, it's off, I guess it is that, I, I guess it is that animal that has so much power that they don't have. Did you uh, relate to or like the movie Jaws? Because that appeared in your short story a little bit. Yes, I I I loved Jaws. I I attempted when I was very young to make a a, a my own version of Jaws. Um, we made a, uh, I, I I cut out a fin. Or I had my neighbor cut out a fin with a, with a table saw and uh, put it on a board. And my mother, my long suffering mother, took us all down to the beach, five kids in a two door car, two door little Ford Maverick, uh, or yeah, Maverick. And, <laughs> uh, and we trawled the fin through the waves. Uh, and that's how we got our shark shots uh, in that in that film. Yeah, my my dad had a Ford Maverick. It was like sixty thousand miles and out, basically. <laughs> Robert wrote, uh, "Sharks are described as the perfect predator and killing machine." Did you create any character to be a shark? Um, is your antagonist a shark? That's a really good question that I've never thought about. Um, it, it's true that in this story that Buddy has these kind of, I don't know whether to describe them as paranoid fantasies, but these fantasies about in which his father kills him, uh, which I don't think is that uncommon. Uh, I, I mean, maybe I'm weird, but I, I didn't, I didn't, it was a thought that occurred to me as a, as a child that my father was a, a mortal threat. Um, you know, not literally, but um, that he was a, a very, un, he was very mentally ill and he was very unpredictable. And so that that sense of unpredictability he wasn't physically abusive but there was that, always that sense of not knowing what the next thing he was going to do was so i guess that that kind of unpredictability is a uh, uh um threatening well, yeah. was it difficult to write about some of those feelings when you wrote ghost horse were you, you do you feel you captured it you were able to represent it within the novel or? As I said, I, uh, the stories were to some extent sketches, some of them, the, the younger stories were sketches for the novel. But I, I like this, <laughs> I have to say, I like the stories better than the, the novel. I like the story form better than the novel form for one thing. Um, uh, but as far as that character, I mean, I think the 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 what I was so pleased about with the way that the this book came out was that there's kind of a, a an overarching narrative that's able to be told if it's these it's kind of a mosaic or a collage that I couldn't do. And the, the thing that I kept struggling with with the novel was um, 
that it had to be this this long coherent narrative and uh i'm not very good at it i don't think of myself as very good at writing plot but i sweated that so much and it actually i mean i think it's a very tightly plotted novel uh and maybe i could have done it differently made it looser but that's that's what i felt i had to do but that novel won a lot of awards so i don't know it's uh it's, it feels kind of funny to hear you talk about it in that way i i mean i I don't know. I, I I mean I I think it's it, I certainly work very hard and I, this, I, at it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's part of an imposter syndrome that I know you've written about. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I certainly felt like that at Stanford in, in the Stegner program. I was like these. I mean, I was in this. I was in program with ZZ Packer, Adam Johnson. Uh, who else was there at that time? Wow. Uh, is that that's enough, right? Of, yeah. Now, when you're working with and writing with folks like that, and you're being taught by uh, these masters that you know they write written memoirs and short stories, are you able to hear and work off of different writers' voices or even different writers' genres to incorporate it, as a writer to incorporate it into your own writing? I think I learned something very important from each of the teachers there. Um, Tobe, Toby had this amazing ability to come in and summarize in like two sentences what was wrong with a piece of writing. And so then we'd all just sit there in the workshop room with nothing else to say for the next 45 minutes, really. <laughs> um, and John had this ability to kind of ask, <laughs> ask all these questions about a piece that you didn't want to think about because they were very, they really got to the guts of what the, the story was. And that, and he was also, uh, you know, a, 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 a former Jesuit priest. So he would just sit there and and everybody would be silent and he'd let everything be silent everybody be silent and let us sort of stew in our own juices until it was very uncomfortable um and uh, uh elizabeth talent also was uh able to ask uh, ask sort of like conceptual questions that i never would have come up with but john i, I john was um so generous and so dedicated and really put himself into every everybody's work um he was a, a, a very a dedicated special person okay i'm gonna wrap up with this question so you still living in texas nope nope i'm right here in belmont massachusetts oh hey that's great so you're teaching at emerson you're teaching live and live students Right. I'm, I'm doing teaching. Sometimes I question whether they're live or not, but yes, they they're <laughs> uh, allegedly live students. They're actually they're great students. Um, Are you still teaching at Stanford, or I teach online with them. Um, it, it's it's been you know it's sort of how I piece together a living. Um, but it's been it, it, it's been a, a very good experience with them. They're they're all adult students. So adult students, you mean age twenty five and above, or uh, yeah, it's 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 the continuing it's, it's in their continuing education program. So they're uh, you know people of of the age of most of the people on this in this Zoom. Uh, they're they're people who have time on their hands and, and, and money to to take these courses. So it's two very different teaching experiences. So the experience of this generation on Zoom, <laughs> since we've noted it, versus the experience of your Emerson students, what is what do you think is 
different in the world experiences that the millennial writer might have that shows up in a lot of the writing that wouldn't show up in the uh, more seasoned individual? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't quite know how to answer it. I think that what I see from the my younger students is, and and I don't know whether this is generational or what, but they don't expect the same sort of coherence from a narrative that people of my generation expect they're kind of okay with things not quite making sense which is is something that i've had to uh accommodate in my expectations as a, as a teacher i i don't think i think there's some very exciting work that's being done you know by um the uh uh uh, a younger writer, Wahini Vara, who just came out with a book called The Immortal King Rao. Uh, she had a story in a, in a uh, O. Henry Awards collection a few years back called I, I Buffalo that was just magnificent. And it, it, it doesn't fit together in the same way that like, you know, uh, a, a story by Alice Monroe does. It, 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 it operates by a different kind of logic. Um, which I think is exciting. Okay, we're out of time, but I really want to thank you for uh, being here. And folks, if you want to know a little bit more about Thomas McNeely, you can go to thomasmcneelywriter.com and there's the book Pictures of a Shark. And we also uh, can show you quickly a cover of Ghost Horse. Um, if I can get, get to it through all the, the Zoom, Two dads are on my screen. So uh, there it is. So check that out. And uh, I really uh, thank you for being here. And uh, folks watching the stream, if you want to show up for the open mic, please use the link and pop on in. Uh, I will let you in for that. And uh, right now I am going to shut down the, the stream. Next week we have uh, Jenna Lee and there she is. So check that out next Thursday. And uh, Thomas, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me, Tim. And thanks, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's good to see you do it. <laughs>